Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. We are Alpha Quadrant 6, a science fiction review show. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the second season of The Mandalorian. The first two episodes have dropped. We've watched them both. And what do you guys think? Are you, you feeling the second season? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like from a tone perspective, they completely matched the pacing and tone of the first season. Um, this isn't the kind of show that like hits you over the top with nonstop excitement. There is a lot of time. They take time, which I really like. Yeah. They're not afraid to have moments where characters are just not moving fast. You know, we're, I think we've become so accustomed to incredibly fast paced edits and everything. And they're not doing that. And I, I'm, was thinking while watching the first episode because I was really analyzing it and comparing it to the first season. I wonder if they're doing that to have it match the way that Star Wars Episode Four was paced and edited. Mm -hmm. I, I can only imagine it's deliberate because everything is very deliberate yeah. in, in this production. No, I agree. I think the pacing is great. I love the level of the storytelling because they're not saving the universe. I mean, so tired yeah. of, you know, shows where every episode they're saving the universe, every movie or whatever. And the this is these are nice side stories, you know, it's like it's a character that's not central to the galaxy or to anything on their own sort of mission, their own quest. They have their own backstory, their 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 own uh, things that they're concerned about, and they're just living life trying to get through their day in the yep. Star Wars universe. And of course, exciting things happen, but at a very appropriate scale yeah. to the yeah. character. And I, it's really enjoyable. You know, I don't have to worry because, you know, when you, every time that the universe is at stake, you know what's going to happen. Right. But when the stakes are the scope is much narrower, anything can happen. Right. Because it's not going to break the world. Yeah. If if they fail or, or succeed or whatever. And also visually, it's, it's quite stunning. I mean, now that we have a greater appreciation of how these special effects are pulled off, it's even more, just m even more amazing to watch. But even at the very first episode, I mean, did they blow their whole special effects budget on that first episode? It was just like pretty, <laughs> pretty wild, pretty amazing special effect, special effects, especially with that, uh, that, the crate dragon uh, thing was, uh, that thing looked alive. It was just so well done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It was cool. You know, I think one of the things that I had to learn to get over with while watching The Mandalorian was kind of uh, taken from what you were saying, Steve. You know, he's not going on these epic adventures and, I, and I'm almost like wanting it to be more epic than it is because I'm used to it. And it doesn't feel like, you know, when the stakes are lower, it doesn't feel like there's as much, you know, intensity happening. But that's why I, the first thing I mentioned was I really appreciate the pacing of the storytelling and to slow it down. We're following a single guy who, you know, is is going through, you know, a very important part of his life. Right. Like he, he's becoming something very important morally. Right. Something the, the 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 child has moved him and he's really a good guy and it's coming out. And I could see him in a weird way, like, you know, he's realizing it in front of our eyes. Well, I think in a lot of ways, this series is hitting the reset button on a lot of trends that have been going on in the last 30 years that I think were ultimately counterproductive. And that is like the universe saving problem where you always have to be raising the stakes, raising the stakes, raising the stakes. And now they're backing all the way back up to it's just this guy's, you know, stakes that we're talking about. Yep. So it reminds me of, for example, a show like Kung Fu, right, with mm -hmm. David Carradine. Every week, he had some encounter with something that, you know, he wasn't saving the West or China or whatever, the world. He was, you know, his, the storyline didn't go beyond a few people, but it was, it was really in interesting because you cared about the character and you cared ab about, you know, their interaction with this interesting backdrop world, you know, the Wild West in this case. And yep. so it's the same thing. We're like, we're in the Star Wars universe and they're, they're so true to form that that in and of itself is just luxurious. It's really fun. The character is awesome. You care about the character. You care about Baby Yoda because they, they hit a home run with that character. Totally. And so just surviving whatever little problem they get into is enough. You know, yeah. that's the episode. And don't forget, and, and Steve, don't forget, we're caring about a character whose face we don't even see. 
mean, this guy's wearing a helmet and we we feel for this guy. We care about him. That That's an amazing feat right there. It's just a helmet. It's true, but the Mandalorian armor is so cool. <laughs> that is the character. I mean, seriously, Boba okay. Fett, we never saw Boba Fett's face. Well, you, you sort of did in the in episode two, but um, he was a cool character just because of all the physical acting and because of the yeah, coolness but, of the armor. But don't forget, Steve, we have now at this point, we have seen a hundred times more Mandalorian than Boba Fett. Yeah, right, a yeah. hundred times more. At some point, all right, the cool armor becomes a little bit jaded because you, you become in, inured to it. But this is like this is he's still. Oh, I, I, think so. I mean, you. But for a lot of, but it's, if, if it was a regular guy, in a, you know, in a some other costume where, they, where you can't see his face, you could, you know, potentially lose lose that that mm-hmm. allure. I think. But it, but they yep. take pains to make it to make it so that you know he what his his slight movements, his expressions, everything. Help suck you into that character instead of mm-hmm. and not care that's, about just looking at a, a cool helmet. That's a testament to the yep. writing, to yep. the directing, and to the acting. Right? He has to they have to have him emote in a different way, or or you know, at least more. But we it, do, it doesn't bother no, me not at, at all, all even, that I can't barely it, think about it. Isn't it odd too? Like it's a it's a weird realization to be like, it doesn't matter. I don't need to see this guy's face. There's no eyebrows, right? There's no there's also, no ma- that's also very Star Wars, right? In, in the Star Wars universe, we fall in love with droids who have zero yeah. facial expression. With R two D two, who doesn't even speak, he just. Bleeps. But look how expressive his beeps were! Amazingly, expressive. I know that's the whole best because that's part yeah. of the magic of Star Wars yeah. is atypical characters that are just armor, like like of course Darth Vader. You don't see yeah, his face. That's either. true. Darth Vader emotes. He has a presence, you know, a charisma that goes beyond. You know, almost you know, many other characters. I think he's the quintessential villain. Don't see his face. Sure, but um, yeah, sure. And I think so. It's the same thing. This is, this, and that's why I think one of the things we love about the Mandalorian is it's hitting all of those Star Wars universe sweet spots. The, you know, the, obviously the space opera part of it, the characters that are built around things other than just you know the way they look, uh, the giant monsters you know that are mm-hmm. so menacing. And uh, it's, you know, it's a wonderful ride. And I like to compare it to Iron Man. Think of Iron Man. How many, how many cuts do we do of, you know, of the face inside of that mask? I mean, I'm sure it was yeah. in his contract that you had to show his face. Uh, but, they, mm-hmm. but they didn't even try to, you know, to, to show just the Iron Man mask or helmet, uh, which, was a cool, which is cool. But you, you still went inside that and, and you saw his face and, and all the, you know, the computer interfaces and stuff. Something that you something Which that we're not a doing. Feel. Right. But it's interesting to think about the Iron Man thing. You know, what what would an Iron Man like TV show, half an hour's, you know, serialized TV show be like if you never saw the Iron right. Man inside right. the costume? You just saw the armor. Because when you think about it, that's what the rest of the world sees. Yeah. And that's a, again, that's also a very deliberate choice. We're not we're not seeing behind the scenes. We're just seeing what the rest of the people yeah. in the Star Wars world would see. And I do think that gives it a grittiness and a me- and a, and a realness and an immediacy that you lose when suddenly you're in this virtual space inside the Iron Man heads up display, and I think this makes it feel more raw, which I like. You know, we we learn so much about the Mandalorian and about um, and about the star the story, right? Like, let me give you some examples of things that hit me over the head. Something as as innocuous as you know, ready spoilers, you know, because we're going to get into details now. A spoilers, yeah, we'll give the whole thing away. He, he climbs into his bed you know, chamber in his ship with the, with the child, right? And he doesn't take his helmet off. He doesn't take his armor off. Like, that armor is him. Mm-hmm. And that's that's part of the allure of, of Mandalorians is that, you know, the anonymity concept is so powerful with them. And it's such a deep seated thing in, their, in his culture. Like, man, the first thing I would do when I got on my ship was take that freaking helmet off. You know, but it it just yeah. does, it doesn't happen. So I I was very much dialing into the character development, and there was a few things that happened in the first episode that really I thought were important. And one, he the second he sees Boba Fett's armor, he, he doesn't know the guy, doesn't know anything. He's like, "Give that to me," and that showed an intense loyalty to his people and to his into their way of life right it's all, you know in a sense kind of like his religion like that's what he you know he personifies that 
he he to such a degree that he's just like it doesn't matter who the guy is give it to me so i thought that was really cool i also loved that when it came down to it he was willing to bargain for it he's not a cold-blooded killer he, he you know to him he's like i can kill this guy in two seconds right he's mm-hmm. not afraid to get into combat but he he's a good person and he and he was willing to bargain with uh the the character who was in charge of the town that that was another really and great that actor thing. was timothy oliphant is that how you pronounce it i, I love, love him, him. Yeah, he's, he's great. fantastic it's great so a couple of other things i noticed guys they the boba fett armor showed up in the star yes. wars universe again that is profound we I know i was we, thinking about that first of all it took me a moment like that's boba fett's armor yeah. that's not just yeah. any mandalorian's yes. armor of course because they're on tatooine right and, and so i guess the uh the, the monster coughed up the armor once he finished digesting Boba Fett at some point. No, no, they they mentioned that the Sarlacc can get killed. And I think that dragon is one of the creatures that can kill and oh, eat a Sarlacc. Right. right. On that, uh, okay, that's I, I missed that nuance. And um, then, don't you love that the Jawas found the armor? Yeah, they, of course they, they, they did. Oh, God, it's, so, it's so perfect. Now, the question is, is Boba Fett dead? That's the question. And and do you want to hear some of the speculation going around uh, the internet on this? Yeah, do it. Uh, at the last yeah. shot of that episode, you see a robed figure. Who is that? That's Tamara Morrison. He played Jango Fett in Attack of the Clones. Hello. Yep. Hello. Ooh. He also <laughs> dubbed the voice of Boba Fett. That's it. Boba Fett is alive. Done. That's right. We're done here. That's right. He's alive. I mean, come on. What, they just threw the actor in there just for the hell of it? You know, I doubt it. So he's alive. Just to create internet confusion. So but he, come escaped. On, like how, he escaped and somehow lost you're a Star Wars fan, his uh, uh, armor. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculously awesome. Like, first <laughs> off, they have the nerve, right? You know, you always get the sense in so many brands that they're afraid to, to spend their capital. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, no, can't talk about that. Like, yes, make a decision. You know, is Boba Fett alive or dead? Where's his armor? What, you know... The fact that 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 might be him, Bob, and I really agree with you, it probably is him. The fact that they're going to pull Boba Fett out of the Sarlacc and we get to see Boba Fett in a completely different way. Oh, my God, that is awesome. They're they're using the brand in the right way. Um, I got a couple other things that really as along those lines. That is like in the Star Wars Rebels cartoon. They pull back Darth Maul. Yeah. Yes. First first movie, you know. Yep. Uh, And again, it's it's always like we knew that that possibility was there. And I, I, this, I think with the Boba Fett thing, one of the, one of the criticisms of return of the Jedi was that the Boba Fett's death was lame. I mean, it was lame. really, you're going to take out that character that way. Right. And so this is rectifying that a little right. bit. Right. And it shows us another thing. If you're bisecting a person with a lightsaber, you do it top down and not across so come on hello <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, another cool thing i mean i you know you know how much i love tatooine the fact that that mando is you know not only does he know tatooine he can speak the oh, yeah. language that the tuscan raiders speak um it gives us a sense of his past which mm-hmm. we don't know we don't really, you know, there's a lot from the childhood snapshot we got of him to who he is today. Like, how could he possibly speak Tuscan Raider, um, whatever that language is called? I thought that yeah. was really cool because it just gives us some depth to his character and, and some mystery. Um, and the other cool thing was we found out that the Raiders aren't just maniacal villains, right? They're they're survivalists. Yeah, they well, I know there, there's been other hints of this, but I, I just love that, you know, we're crawling into, you know, the Jawas a little bit more. We're crawling into, uh, you know, these are these are staples of the Star Wars universe that have been unexplored, right. and they're and they are very intelligently exploring them, which is such so important. Why is it important? Because the freaking last three Star Wars movies didn't do it. They didn't push that needle forward at all. They really didn't. They just did a terrible retread. But we're not going to get into that. No, but, but that but was a testament to the really good writing I think that we're seeing in the Mandalorian. The second episode. We have a little bit of a run-in with a couple of X-wing fighters. And was that, that was awesome? That was, great. That, that, that that was, was awesome, a moment. Think about it, guys. Think about how much exposition we got. How yes. much they fleshed out where we are in the arc of history in the galaxy yeah. with the very little interaction yeah. that we had. That was exquisite. 
we've yes. got a really good feel for where the the state is of the new republic that where what happened to the rebels you know what are they, what are they doing now what kind of chaos the galaxy is in it was reflected in that interaction so well that it, you know there you don't you don't need some big exposition telling us what's going yeah. on right it was just reflected in the action and in the, in the dialogue. behavior of those characters yep. and in the dialogue i love it that's the way to get across what's going on. You don't need somebody to tell us what's going on. So, so the I'm Mandalorian really is... Really loving the writing. Yeah, absolutely. It has profound hooks in Star Wars lore. Mm. Everything. All of the imagery. You know, they didn't do what what the, the uh, like, movies uh, 7, 8, and 9 did, where they, like, you know, changed the style of things yet again. You know, so the first three movies, the style was different. Than, than four, five, and six. And then you get to the last three movies in the style, like even the Stormtrooper helmets are different. Like, we're not doing that. They, they decided, like, this story is happening, you know, what, five, ten years in that time frame after, um, you know, the movie six. Yeah. And, you know, things are still, the ships aren't going to dramatically change. And, you know, why would they change the, the Stormtrooper armor? You know, why, why would there be an update to that? It, they don't bother doing that. If anything, they triple down. When those X-Wings came onto the screen, you know, and I admit, you know, I'm, I am getting, I'm like, I am, I was a kid when Star Wars came out. When Star Wars, the movie four came out, I was a kid. You know, this is my whole life has gone by and I'm still that kid loving <laughs> Star Wars when I, when I watch Star Wars, watching those X-Wings come onto that screen was euphoric yeah. for, for a guy like me. Yeah. Like the fact that the guys that were in the, uh, that were flying the ships weren't like really good looking buff, you know, yeah. like I am flying a spaceship. They you were know, the guys that, who, who survived yeah. and got recruited yeah. probably at the end of the rebellion. Yeah. But the, I but I think that was a cool decision that Lucas made when he cast movie four, where he wasn't casting like these super handsome strapping guys. Like he was like, these are normal people. Yeah. And and they're these are right, these and are, they're normal people even in real life. One one of those actors was a uh it's like a cosplayer at uh at, at conventions that and uh yep. and so they just said, "Hey, you want to act in? You want to be have a part in season two? Like, holy crap! Can you imagine? I know, right? Are you kidding me? That is so awesome. So, you know, when we when we do the thirty thousand foot view of just these two episodes, it it completely dovetails perfectly into the first season. Um, you know, they they're advancing the characters. We're learning more about the characters. I mean, the baby baby Yoda like is vocalizing now, so he's becoming a little bit more mature. He's he's a huge source of cuteness and humor, but he doesn't make it hokey, which is yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, also, I liked about the second episode without get, without giving too much away about his behavior, because there is a because he is a baby Yoda. You know, we tend to think of him as this mystical creature. Yeah, but don't forget, he's yeah. fifty years old. He's 50 years yeah, old. Yeah, that's true. I'm not saying that he's a child. He's 50 years old, although that's young for yes. that species, apparently. But he's also just a creature, a biological organism who has yep. the same kind of biological needs that anybody Likes has. Likes eggs. Yes, he can use the force, but he's not a magical, mystical creature, you know? And so that I do think that they, um, I can't say humanized, but you know, they, they really made him more, again, sort of gritty and real and less yes. etheric in yeah. this episode. In a way that was a little surprising. You were actually questioning what's going on here, what's really going on. It's like, oh, it is just what we thought it was. Okay, you know, that, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. I'm also happy that they they aren't using Baby Yoda as the the thing that solves all the big problems. Yes. I I kept thinking, is Baby Yoda gonna lift up the spider? Is Baby Yoda yeah, gonna do this? And they're too. not. He's a baby. He's a baby. And the fact that when he went over and put his hand on the jar, the jar that had the yeah. eggs in it. And I'm thinking he's detecting the force, you know, and I'm like going up. He was doing it because he wanted to eat them. I yeah, thought that's that what I was talking that, about. He just wanted to eat but the I eggs. love I love that. They just made they just made him, uh, you know, like more alive yeah. because of those things. And let's you know he's not saving. He's not he's not the, uh, you know, God in the machine, like saving everything when things get too hot. And let's which, you know, they did in the first season. He did do a couple of very important yeah. maneuvers in the first season. And they're not abusing that, which is important. And let's not forget, guys, the coolest monster in episode two. Do you remember? Yeah. With the, with the... Of course. Yeah. The spider <laughs> Kricknas. These are spider Kricknas. And this guy's not going to shut up. So I'm going to throw him over on there. Yes, he's good. Oh, boy. The cat just leaped. Um, so this is a, <laughs> a Krickna spider. And there is precedent for this. Jay, you know the name, Ralph McQuarrie. He is the, the yeah. visual 
master of Star Wars. He came up. He, he designed he, Star basically Wars. Basically, the visual look of Star Wars, he came up with that design. And, and, and wasn't it Lucas who took those images and used them to actually sell the whole concept of the entire movie based on, uh, based on Lucas, those images? Yeah, Lucas knew that he it was a very difficult thing to sell because it had never been done before. And he picked the best probably the best artist in the world that to right. match his needs. And Ralph McQuarrie actually brought the script to life. So as Lucas is t discussing the script and t telling him what the look and feel would be, he's holding up these, the original drawings that Ralph McQuarrie did. And it sucks you in every single one yeah. of his drawings are, yeah. are magic. And those Krickness spiders, Ralph McQuarrie created some images of them on Dagobah, uh, which were, of course were never used. And then the spiders were reused again in a, in some early, uh, Star Wars novel that I don't think it was canon at that time, but then it was they used them in Star Wars Rebels. So Steve, you've seen them yeah, in Star Wars Rebels. So uh, so now That's so now they are, they are canon. Yeah. They are awesome. I love those Krickness spiders. Yes, you know, and another another interesting thing. You know, I'm watching a lot of YouTube videos, and there are people that are heavily discussing like what's going on with Star Wars in general. Um, and there, there's a big thing going on right now because Kathleen Kennedy is being squeezed out. And she's already like canceled her TV show that she was show running. Um, you know, this is all coming from the top down now because, you know, Favreau and his, and Filoni are taking over. They're working with George Lucas. They're writing t 10 years of Star Wars, you know, movies, TV shows, cartoons. They're, they are the writers now, which is Great. makes me ecstatic. They realized what happened was Disney realized, even though they made money on these on those last three movies, that the fans just didn't like it. Yeah. Most fans didn't like it. I know some people, I've talked to a lot of people, some people like those movies. I'm talking about the core fan base, the largest part of the fan base, you know, didn't really appreciate it and didn't like it. I'm not saying that if you liked it, there's something wrong with you. But I am saying though that they they really did in my opinion break from the 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 canon and from where where the where the, the story felt like it needed to go. It was go. just bad storytelling. That's it was bad line. storytelling. Yeah. So now we have a new team. Kathleen Kennedy is being squeezed out, and you know these guys are 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 writing the next decade plus of content. You know the Mandalorian um, was basically like the first Iron Man movie, which Favreau also oh, did. By, by the, the way, way. <laughs> he he <laughs> he was he capable of setting things up. Setting things up. He really is uh, very good at what he does. I, I have total faith in him in a way that I never had. You know, remember when we were saying things before the movies came out, like, are they going to release, you know, movie movies four, five, and six in their unedited version? You know, and I was thinking Disney was going to knock this out of the park. And the, it, it, they didn't. And now they're going to do it. They, You know, Lucas is back. And as much as we've, we could go up and down and, with Lucas... I have mad respect for Lucas now in a way that I didn't before. As a when creator, he, he's a bad director. He's not a good director. But right. But when he a, is in the position creator. he's in now, he's a co-writer, co-creator. Yeah. He's got other people who are actually in charge, like, you know, reeling him back in. Because Lucas, I think, tends to want things to be a little bit too uh, child centric. Yeah. The tone that they hit in movies four or five and, and most of six, I think were perfect for Star Wars. Um, like, you know, um, the Empire Strikes Back was even darker than episode four. Yeah. And I liked Minus it. I the liked Ewoks. The, the Ewoks was the yeah. stumble. But if this is the pivot, if this is Disney's pivot in their Star Wars franchise, wait, Star to go, Wars is back. that's the right decision. They are going yep. in the right direction more. We want more of, and it, everything that the Mandalorian represents, everything, not just the writing, the look and the feel, the scope the characters, but also I'm loving, and I, and I have since the, you know, the, all of, for all the animated star Wars series, the, the, the serialized, you know, long format TV show, you know, TV show. Yeah. I'd rather have 10 one hour yes. episodes in a year than one, one off movie where they have to save the universe. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I, absolutely. Yes. And, and do it. It's better. Right. It's better story. And look what they're doing with the technology, their technology. They, yes. they are creating technology and advances that all movies in the future are, are going to start doing. Uh, are, Which is also well, a Star Wars legacy. Right, right. ILM, I found Industrial out, Light I, Magic, for sure. That was created I for the I found out some movie. information. So my wife uh, is, you know, she works in production. She's a production manager. Um, and she was in LA and she got to visit a LED studio. And it was like a three-quarter studio. It wasn't like um, the one that they use on The Mandalorian, which is almost, I think they can actually complete that circle. Um, 
So she found out one that when they the when you say the volume, right. that's not actually the name of the studio that they use, and it's more about the screens, I guess. You know, she was saying that like you could say that any one of those any any LED setup like that is called a volume for some reason, and I think it has to do with the technology more more than like a name that it was given. So that was interesting because I you know the, I I I picked that up wrong when I was listening to. Uh, that the, the information that Favreau was giving about his state, his studio. That's number one. Number two, it, Bob, lots of studios have, they have these staging, the stages now they can do it. It's being used more and more and more. It's being picked up. Like it's we a, said, you know, we knew that this was going to happen. It's a no brainer. Initial investment. It's a no brainer for lots of scenarios. You could save, you could save so much money. Um, you know, if, if, it, you know, but you, not everyone, it'll make sense. You got to have the money. You got to have the, you know, the, the, the reason, cause they were on, they were on such a time crunch and you know, when they, when they were planning out the Mandalorian, they would have had to fly all, all these low to locations and do, and do scouting. Yep. This made, even though it was expensive, it made a lot of sense and it's just, uh, it's taken, mm -hmm. it's going to take over. And I was thinking of you, Bob, when I was watching, I, I forget which episode it was in, but there was a scene uh, where it was, I was at dusk or at dawn. I can't remember. And I remember you saying that, you know, having the ability to shoot, you know, 10 hours of footage when it's, when it looks like it's dawn, yeah. you don't have to run out and do it in the real world. You just have it. You just do it in the, in the, dawn it, in the studio for yeah. as long yeah, as that, you that, need that's, it to film. That's yeah. awesome. So guys, season two is, is happening. I'm incredibly excited. You know, I'm looking forward to the future of star Wars in a way that I wasn't a year ago. Mm -hmm. They're doing a great job. If you enjoy this episode, if you'd like AQ6, you can go to Alpha Quadrant and the number six.com. We have a YouTube channel. We're on Facebook. Um, we are slowly converting these shows into podcasts. You know, we just need more time. The, you know, as you know, the pandemic has significantly slowed us down. Here we are again, not in the studio together. You know, we, we have the studio set up now uh, with a green screen in the background and, and for other reasons as well, because we have other projects that we work on. And the problem is that because COVID is starting to come back up, it's worse now than it ever was. Yeah. We can't we can't be together without masks. And we didn't want to do the show with masks. So I'm guessing that the next few months, maybe, until things get better, we're, we're gonna have to be doing it remotely like this again. But you know, but I'm still working on the studio. It's still gonna look cooler. We have a lot of fun stuff coming up for Alpha Quadrant Six. And I will tell you right now, we have a Weta documentary that we shot last year. Uh, so it was like, you know, no, November, December of 2019. We are at the very end of post-production on that. We, we did a, uh, we interviewed a bunch of the creators there and we talked to them about a specific process that happens at Weta. I think you're really going to love it. I'm very excited. So, you know, we're probably, we could be a month away from dropping that. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure yet. We're not rushing it because I just want to do it right. Um, so good things coming up. So you can please do like us, by the way, click the bell. Do all the things you know that we want you to do, and you can become a patron as well if you want to support us.